Disco Elysium is a game for nerds who like to read. There's no combat, there's no action, it's all just text coming at you in short bursts, in precise snippets, coming with superb voice acting, sublime sound effects and restrained screen shake, so that even if reading is everything you do, it feels expensive and luxurious, because it is. Coming in at around a million words written over five years, Disco Elysium has won numerous awards for its writing, including four game awards in 2019. It currently holds a near-perfect Metacritic score of 97, and all of that is nice and good, but in the end, Disco Elysium is a game about reimagining yourself, and I wholeheartedly recommend you to go experience it on your own. So this is your first and final warning. Do not watch this video if you're not done with Disco Elysium, because I will casually spoil everything from here on out. Disco Elysium is a CRPG, a computer role-playing game, and like all games of its genre, it is a walking contradiction, because role-playing exists in the moment. It is a collective delusion, where everything takes place in your imagination, where situations become real and reactive as soon as you describe them. And compared to this high-speed imagination to interactivity pipeline, video games are static and premeditated things, where even the most emergent narrative can only emerge from foundational rules and offered variables, and Disco Elysium knows this, because despite Harry's best efforts, he does not actually start the game as a blank slate. Something has led to you waking up in that hotel room, just like someone must have killed that dude, and you not only have to find out who did it, but also why you did this to yourself. In both cases, the past is at fault. The past in general, the concept of time passing, slipping through your fingers unnoticed until it is too late, until you realize that you have irrevocably lost the thing that means the world to you. And now you're left with the choice between two extreme options. You can either glorify what happened and refuse to let go of an increasingly ennobled and inaccurate memory, or you can try to erase memory itself, drowning in a spiral of self-pity and gradual self-destruction. And Harrier Dubois, like most people, can do both at the same time, which provides the conceptual glue that holds Disco Elysium together thematically. For what is a theme if not something that gets mentioned, like, all the time? While Harry might have tried his best to obliterate himself, his body, his limbic system, his RPG stats cannot let him forget what kind of animal he really is. Intellect wants you to pursue objective truth and to impose it onto others with the biggest available words, but it also confuses the history of the world with personal drama. While motorics is not only your cat-like desire to always land on your feet financially, it is also your muscle memory prying open the hidden compartments of your past, and physique does not want you to do that. Physique wants to get fucked up, chasing transient pleasures instead of facing reality, just like how Psyche wants you to understand how other people feel. It wants to make connections, it wants to hear voices where there aren't any, just as long as you don't have to deal with who you used to be and what you left behind. And so, no matter which combination of stats you start the game with, each of them is not only internally torn and compromised, but also directly reflected in the case that you're trying to solve. The murdered mercenary of international capital was a drug-addled man of the moment, stumbling around Martinez, muttering madly to himself, tearing it up, soldier of the apocalypse style, an extreme version of Harry, all psyche and physique, all outwards, all violence, all insane, all now. While Joseph, the murderer, is a communist who never surrendered, who has been hiding in the reeds, dreaming of the past, held together by composure and ideology, watching the world through the scope of his sniper rifle. The other extreme version of Harry, the one that is all intellect and motorics, that is all self-contained, all glorification, all alone, all memory. In Disco Elysium, you cannot forget or escape from the past, because the whole game was designed, developed and written as a reflection of your character's internal conflict. The cool thing about Disco Elysium is that it is a video game, and that you get to experience this internal conflict dynamically. On the cold streets of Martinez, under the symbolic ramblings of a standard alcoholic, there is a yellow bag. You do not have to pick it up. You can finish the whole game without ever laying a finger on its worn plastic, but if you do equip it, then you will look upon the world with new eyes. 
The crumbling streets and decaying buildings will suddenly be richer as bottles become pick upable and as trash turns to cash. And then maybe, many days later, you're still seen carrying that yellow bag around with you out of pure habit, collecting bottles to turn into cents that you no longer need. In Disco Elysium, your choices never fundamentally change the world, but they do change how you perceive that world and therefore how you engage with it. The constant interruptions and comments from your skills are much more dynamic than the Frittebag because they rely on passive skill checks, a pen and paper mechanic where the dice are rolled in secret to determine whether a character notices something that the player never even asked about. Passive skill checks have not seen a lot of use in CRPGs because of their exorbitant cost. If you fail the check, then all the work that went into creating it goes unappreciated, but it is exactly this wasteful, luxurious use of passive skill checks that makes reading text in Disco Elysium so engaging, because when a passive role fails, then the conversation just keeps moving smoothly, but when a passive role succeeds, then a new, maybe crucial piece of information is given to you before the conversation just keeps moving smoothly. And so every time a skill speaks up, it makes you aware of all of the times when it didn't speak up, and you wonder how much you might have missed and what kind of truths Disco Elysium is hiding from you. The much less dynamic, hard-coded, baseline reactivity fulfills a similar function, but from a different direction. When Kim mentions the fact that you just spent the whole day running around with only one shoe, then that is not only a funny and memorable moment, it also raises a question. What else is the game keeping track of? You cannot know for sure, and suddenly every decision you make becomes more interesting, simply because it might be recorded, it might be reacted to later, and so you start to feel as if there actually was a real-life game master watching over you. But Disco Elysium is a video game. Everything inside of it has been handmade, and this constant micro-reactivity is simply not sustainable, forcing the game to cast wider nets with its thought cabinet, a video game system that can lead to moments of hilarious emergence, like when rigorous self-critique is internalized after sitting alone on a bench for an hour, or when you become a fascist after reading a cheap fantasy novel. Just like drugs, clothes and items, Thoughts exist outside of Disco's dialogue system, but they all affect your skills, which in turn determine how you engage with the world. Disco Elysium consists of multiple novels worth of text, where not only hard-coded reactions, but dynamic systems act as filters, laid over the text to determine which paragraphs you get to read and which ones will remain hidden from you. The four stats and the 24 skills that are forming this dynamic filter are all dealing with Harry's internal conflict in their own unique way, referencing and remembering events and concepts through their own function and from their own perspective. What grounds all of this high concept stuff is that each possible perspective you can inhabit is mirrored and represented in the world around you. Everything that your version of Harry can think and feel is also somewhere out there for you to stumble upon and to recognize yourself in. And this extends to Elysium's incredibly dense history, lore and pop culture, which the game relies on to overwhelm you with raw information, with daunting detail details, with world-buildingly mimetic mutterings, connecting characters and concepts without calling for additional code. And all of this would be a lot easier to understand if Disco wasn't written by depressed intellectuals, because the dynamically assembled meat of the game leans towards being very literary verbose prose, standing in stark contrast to the princesses in another dangerous-to-go-alone type of video game writing. And it is this comparative complexity of the text itself that turns the basic activity of reading into a constant puzzle. Measurehead is not just a black racist, he's a semini supremacist, and since neither we nor Harry know what that means exactly, we can approach the concept of racism from a conceptual angle, only to then find out that Harry's version of racism is pretty fucking stupid. It's based on territory, not pseudoscience. It wants Ravishol forever to turn from tag to truth. It uses fantasy metaphors. It's a fascism of the immediate feelings of the body, of physique, a stat that is trying to project manly strength while also being a drug-driven paranoid masochist. It's a very specific, gleefully vindictive depiction of nationalism. 
Because when you play Disco Elysium earnestly, when you select the answers that you most closely align with in your actual real-life convictions, then, like a sadistic 40 euro personality test, Disco will show you a distorted, grotesque, but maybe even to some degree accurate, reflection of yourself. You think you are a nationalist? Nope, you're just stupid, and you hate women, and yourself, you sad fucking loser. You are an ultra-liberal? Nope, you're a psychopath, licking the ideological boots of even bigger psychopaths. You think you are a communist? Nope, you just like making video essays. And so, when you read what people have to say about Disco Elysium, it's always pretty easy to guess what kind of cop they played, because they often look at the game only through the lens of communism or the feeling of shivers, completely ignoring all the other delicate perspectives. Psyche, on the other hand, is all about perspectives. It's about understanding other people. It's about making connections. Like, did you know that the movie that Harry rented all those years ago is a reference to Georg Büchner's play Wojtzeck? Or that René Arnaud is the name of an actual tip-top race car driver? Did you know that both Joyce on her boat and real-life game designer Chris Crawford in his book on interactive storytelling mention prions as things that always arrive unexpectedly? Or did you know that if you draw all thoughts, NPCs, items, couple types and political alignments onto a map based on thematic proximity to their respective stats, that you then get a structure that consists of four divergent dendrites all growing away from from Harry, did you know that? Psyche is about connections. Maybe too many connections, as it can turn you into an insane raving lunatic. But Psyche is the best stat of Disco Elysium, because it adds the most points of view to the game, with the horrific necktie being your 25th skill and your third party member, a literal manifestation of your mind that has a surprising and hilarious narrative arc. If you want the most story out of Disco Elysium, then Psyche, like charisma in conventional CRPGs, is the way to go, because it not only allows you to talk to your tie, it also connects you to Kim Kitsuragi. From Kim's perspective, Disco Elysium is a very long escort mission, where Harry keeps getting stuck on the metaphorical level geometry of his own drug-addled brain. When Kim leaves you to do some adult stuff like driving a car when you are alone, then sitting on a bench to pass some time becomes something you can do, allowing you to wait for him to return, because without Kim some quests cannot be completed, but without Kim everything is less fun. He is your straight man, he's your counterpart in every way, he's the deadpan rejection of insanity that makes pretending to be insane enjoyable in the first place. He's the personified notification telling you that nobody liked that, but he is also a very well composed, patient and pragmatic man, and so we feel bad when we put him through our shit, because we have all been in similar situations ourselves, where one friend is way drunker than all the others and you have to awkwardly stand there and watch as they... Maybe we have been that friend ourselves. In any case, Kim is probably the most interesting and believable NPC I have ever seen in a game. He often reminded me of an inexperienced but determined pen and paper player who approaches the game methodically and coolly, who has chosen character traits that are min-maxed for case solving. Because finishing quests is what Dungeons and Dragons is all about, right? When you ask Kim what political ideology he subscribes to, he says that he believes in the RCM, the organization that is a healthy mix of all the extreme political ideas floating around Ravishol, threatening to pull the city back into chaos. It would be a pity if that happened, wouldn't it? And don't worry, we're sure that the apocalyptic folk myth of the return has nothing to do with the primal entity under the church, or with the stashes of weapons that we keep finding in the purple cocaine catacombs don't worry, we got this under control, everything is fine, focus on what's in front of you, focus on the case. In Disco Elysium you read some text, and as a reward you get to read some more text. In between the endless sentences you get to make choices, and where passive skill checks are a translated pen and paper mechanic, the techniques and patterns of Disco's dialogue draw from the rich and often forgotten history of visual novels and interactive fiction. Because for all of its video game systems, Disco Elysium was handwritten. Every choice you see has been consciously created by someone, and even if Disco calls itself a CRPG, it can never truly simulate role-playing. But if you just consider the difference between yes and lie, then you will discover that you do not need the endless reactivity of pen and paper to encounter interesting problems. All you need is tension between the choices you can make. 
And Disco Elysium knows this, so it presents you with seven options to say yes and one option to say no when you think about smoking a cigarette. It lets you choose between yelling fuck the world and falling over. It lets you choose between saying something insane and saying something sexist. It lets you choose between fucking kill yourself, you asshole. And then, no matter what we choose, we usually end up in the same place anyways. But we don't really want to be mad, because it was our actual choice. We decided which version of the story we wanted to become real. But we also remember the options that we did not pick, and they shape our idea of who Harry could have become, how he could have acted, and we try to imagine how the situation could have evolved. And even if Disco then turns out to never fundamentally branch, we can take pleasure in the fact that it has given us a lot of space to act. And so on the first day of Disco, we bumble around Martinez in an excited stupor, choosing all of the weird options, testing just how far the game is willing to let us go. It lets us go far, adding nuance to the boring choice between good and evil by replacing evil with three different versions of absolutely unhinged. Yeah, you might be an asshole, but you're an asshole with character, with style, with convictions. You are the lovable kind of deadbeat alcoholic. The first few active skill checks are funnier if you fuck them up. This is where you can have a heart attack while trying to grab your tie. This is where you can I want to make fuck with you. And this is where Raphael Ambrosius Cousteau adds a new choice to almost every dialogue for the rest of the game. This is where Disco Elysium is infinite. The first day feels so open and free because every quest you get is actually a side quest. You do not need to get the body from the tree, you do not need to enter the harbor, you do not need to talk to Choice or the smoker on the balcony. All you need to do to progress is to wait for Tidus, who shows up on the second day of Disco. Disco Elysium consists of a series of mandatory active skill checks that are surrounded by side quests. If you fail at the main check, then the game pushes you to explore the site content, to level up and to get more information, which enables you to retry. And here, for the first time, you actually need to do something. Here, failure is not just a fun thing that adds role-playing opportunities anymore. Here, failure just locks you out of progress. And then this pattern repeats itself two more times, once again with Titus and once with the infamous felt mural, and as you're standing there, in front of these gates, dice in hand, you get to make the actual, the real decision of Disco Elysium. Do you want to save scum or not? Playing without safe scumming makes the game richer as a game, because it pushes you to use all of its systems and to notice how they overlap with the narrative. Unlike your ledger or your car, failing at an active skill check is not an act of prescribed static reformation, it's an act of randomness, and while the odds of Disco are very game-designed, randomness always feels less authored, less forced, and so the power of Disco's structure reveals itself when you accept failure, when you just invest a point into the relevant skill in order to retry immediately. Because the point you just spent stays where you put it, permanently affecting your dynamically assembled stream of consciousness, making that skill more likely to speak up for the rest of the game. You haven't just spent a point to increase the skill, you have quite literally changed your mind, and you have done so mechanically. Seeing this incremental change unfold over the course of the whole game, maybe not even realizing that it is happening until it is too late, is the real magic of Disco Elysium. But when failure consistently stops you from progressing, then you need to hunt for quests and grind for XP, you need to suck all the content out of Disco Elysium until all the dialogue trees are dull and grey. The longer the game goes on, the more the balance between talking and running tips in favour of running back and forth across the desolate, empty coastline for hours, unsure whether you softlocked yourself or not, desperately looking for someone to talk to, realising that the open world is closing soon. It is the sad truth of any creative endeavor that you have to finish the work before the money runs out. The way in which Disco Elysium shrivels up towards the end is especially heartbreaking because of the incredible openness of the first day. It might be foolish to expect so much from a game, but it might also be irresponsible of a game to promise so much and to then rein its branches in so suddenly and brutally. But the only reason that we get to play and talk about Disco Elysium at all is that the seemingly infinite openness withers away as the book overtakes the dice, while the puzzle assembles itself. Because time, 
does not stop for your grand visions. And if you do not adapt your scope, then reality and rent will take everything from you. Faced with such hard, horrible borders, it can be tempting to retreat into delusional fantasy or to dissolve your brain in an endless stream of stimulation, but the only way to deal with all of this is to take an honest look at yourself and to decide if it's time to double down or to opt out. And so it is very fitting that the story that Disco tells is not one of heroic individual action, it's not one of saving the world, instead it's a story of pragmatism, about facing yourself, historically speaking, and to then work with what you have instead of running away from it. When you replay the game, when you go through the same events as a different Harry with a different perspective, then the illusion of a truly dynamic experience shatters completely, but the thematic coherence of the book beneath the dice becomes apparent. Now that you know that the version of Harry that could not let go of the past killed the version of Harry that ran away from it, you can focus on poking at the intricate, dynamically assembled, interactive web of connections that makes Disco Elysium such an impossibly rich game. As a pure book, Disco would be an unsubtle avalanche of subtext, but because everything is assembled on the go, and in response to randomness and probability, you never see the whole picture. Instead, you can imagine Disco Elysium as a huge, interactive funnel. The more time you spend inside of it, the more you notice that it is pushing you towards a single conclusion. The longer the game goes on, the narrower it has to become, until you inevitably arrive at the end. But you can also imagine Disco Elysium as a kaleidoscope. It can produce infinite, colorful variations and patterns, but each and every one of them will eventually turn out to emerge from a single focal point. You cannot change the past, and you cannot change who did it. You can only change who arrives on that island to finally solve the case. It is here, in a place that was nearby but always out of reach, that Disco Elysium reveals its four endings. The first ending of Disco Elysium is about the dream something, the woman that you abandoned long before she left you, only to become a goddess in your memory. Here you will tell yourself the truth, here you will finally separate fact from fiction. The second ending of Disco Elysium is about the deserter, who has held on to his rifle for over 50 years, but who cannot keep himself together any longer. Here you find out that he did it, but also that he did it to himself. The third ending of Disco Elysium is about the horrible, impossible beauty that is out there right now, between the reeds and the rotten wood, waiting for you to find it, waiting for you to believe in it. The last ending of Disco Elysium is about your group, about the people that you hurt, but that still came back for you one last time. Here you will be judged for your actions, and here you will be defended by your new friends. Disco Elysium has four endings, and they arrive suddenly, one after the other, right at the end of an exhausting investigation. It is easy to miss them, because they take up so little space compared to the piles of prose that are dedicated to the dumbest distractions. It's easy to overlook the four endings of Disco, because they come at the end of a long funnel, because they come hours after you realize that you never really had a choice. But maybe. It's also easy to overlook the four endings of Disco Elysium, because they all tell you the exact same thing. Thank you for watching.